before we get started on today's teaching, how many of you are grateful? Amen. What the Lord's been teaching me is to develop an attitude of gratitude. Yes. How easy is it to focus on the negative? How easy is it to focus even on the demons and not the angels when there's two-thirds of the angels on our side? That the Lord has been teaching me to develop an attitude of gratitude. And, you know, um, we all go through things. Right now I'm having some back issues. But the Lord says, but what do you have? I still have eyes. I still have ears. I still have hands. I still can walk. What is it that you still have? What is it that you can be grateful for? So this week, I so encourage you to start taking a few minutes throughout the day and stop. What can you be grateful for? To practice an attitude of gratitude. If you're even having a cup of coffee, yeah. to stop a cup of tea, a glass of water, that do you know there's places where they can't even drink the water or they don't have running water like we do um, have sit and contemplate on your cup somebody had to make that somebody had to put it on the market your coffee somebody had to grow the beans and pick the beans and and market those beans and it had to get to the store and you even had finances that you could go to the store and purchase that and have it. You have water in your home. You have all these things that you can sit and just be grateful for. The enemy wants us focusing on negative. Murmuring and complaining as the children of Israel did when they came out of Egypt. They would come to the next Thing, and they would murmur and complain instead of realizing all that God has done for them. So will you practice an attitude of gratitude with me this week yes. as we focus on the greatness of God? Amen. And we can be grateful and thankful for all those things. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to open in prayer. Today I'm going to be speaking on inner healing, and I'm going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, we just stop. We stop our minds from racing, our minds from seeing all the other things that, that is out there. Father, the politics, the, the gas prices, the food prices, we just put it all aside right now, Father, and focus upon you, the king of the universe. And as we come into this sanctuary, this place set apart on this Shabbat to come before you, the king of the universe, to think about how great and mighty you are, Father. Father, we give you honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving. In Yeshua's holy name, amen and amen. 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 I am excited. We are in a season, a new season, and we're in a time that God is moving in our generation. You guys are sitting out there going, I don't see it. Do you know that things are happening in the spiritual realm right now that is so amazing? We are in the last the last days. Once Israel became a nation again, a clock started. We don't even realize the season that we're in. A, a, an incredible season and time that we're in spiritually. I believe with all of my heart that our Heavenly Father is sending His Spirit without measure in these last days to cleanse His bride. Amen. Now, two things are going to happen. The bride of Christ is going to hear that and be wooed to it and come into it and, and be cleansed and healed and restored. And 
the sinners are going to go darker. Yep. There's going to be a separation like you've never seen before. A couple of weeks ago, I preached on how God called Abram out of his country, had to leave the paganism behind. He had to separate himself. There's a season of separation happening. But if you are the bride, now let me ask you, are you the bride? Amen. Have you accepted him as Lord and Savior? You have been put on a path that is so amazing right now that you don't even understand what the Spirit of the living God is doing. He is coming back for his bride. He's preparing his bride for the second coming. And what does that mean? He's restoring our soul. And this is a reformation that we are coming into like we've never seen before. John 4 says that salvation comes through the Jews. How many of you know your bridegroom, Yeshua HaMashiach, is Jewish? Yeah. You know that. Yes. Salvation comes through the Jews. And we must worship him in spirit and what? Truth. Spirit and truth. Say spirit and truth. So the truth is the word of God. He's washing his bride in these last days with his spirit washing us with water by his word. Say his word. His word. So we need to understand what his word says, what he's doing in these last days. I remember being 26 and a mess. I was desperate to be happy. Everything that I was doing wasn't working. I was lonely. I was rejected. I was bankrupt in every area of my life. And I was absolutely miserable. Have you ever been there? Yeah. That's a great place to be. Because when you press in, when you give up, when you surrender, God wants to do something in your life. But many of us have no clue. I had no clue what God wanted to do in my life. I just wanted to be happy. I wanted a magic wand to be over my life and just puff and everything work out. But you know, God had some other plans for me. He gave me a vision of two brides, one filthy and one spotless. And he said, the filthy bride is what my church looks like today. But I'm coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, a glorious bride. At 26, being broken, my life being destroyed, being bankrupt in every area of my life, I had no clue what that meant. I didn't even care what that meant. Because when you're in such distress emotionally, none of the things that God speaks seems to even make sense to you. Am I talking to anybody? Yeah. Today, the church, the, the church that we know it, especially in America and around the world, how many pastors are praying for revival? They're saying, oh God, we need that move of your Holy Spirit again. We need revival. We need to come up with a new gimmick. We need to sell more of the Holy Spirit. Come on. There's prostitution going on in the church today. There's tradition of man going on in church today. And just like that little girl back there at 26, wanting to get happy, wanting God to do something in my life, I didn't know it was going to cost me. I didn't know it was going to cost me everything of my life. I didn't know I had to give up my sin. I didn't know that I had to be cleansed and purged and purified and sanctified. I didn't know that I was broken on the inside. I didn't know my past had affected me. I didn't know tradition of man was keeping me in bondage. 
revive life. See, the church today is broken. The body of Christ is broken. She's actually on life support, if you ask me. I see her on life support. And pastors are praying for, for a move of the Holy Spirit. And hallelujah, do we need that. But we need to get rid of tradition of man. We need to get rid of denominations and all the garbage that Satan has placed upon this, the body of Christ as a counterfeit. Amen. Because God is trying to restore us today. Amen. God is trying to move us into the new. Yeshua said you can't put new wine in old wine skins. We're crying out because we're broken. We're crying out because we're, we're hurting. We're crying out because of the abuse that we've lived in, the dysfunction we've lived in. Oh, precious ones, the word of God says, ask for the ancient past. And what are the ancient past? It says, ask for the ancient past and it will be well with your soul. Amen. What is the Father trying to do in these last days but get well with your soul, Amen. your mind, your emotion, and your will? He wants you restored. Yes. He wants the church restored. Yes. Precious ones, when the church looks like the world, we're in trouble. Amen. When the pastors are into pornography and adultery, we're in trouble. Yes. When the church is having abortion and their members, we're in trouble. Yes. When divorce is happening at a higher rate than the world, we're in trouble. Yes. When there's alcohol and drug and witchcraft in the church, we're in trouble. Yes. He's trying to do something in these yes. last days, yes. but we got to line up to his yes. kingdom and his will. Again, there's a reformation happening right now in our midst, in your generation. Your generation. Look to somebody and say, my generation. Not a hundred years past. Not looking at the past move of the Holy Spirit. He is moving today in your generation. But we have to line up to his will. We have to come in at what he wants, not what we want. We have to let go of tradition of man. We have to ask for him to give us truth and be willing to listen to the truth. Precious ones, if you can't get the church to quit doing Halloween, how in the hell are you going to get them to stop doing Christmas and Easter? That's counterfeit. Witchcraft in the church. Witchcraft happening in the church. Precious ones, God is saying, wake up. We are in a reformation move. What's a reformation? It's a process of reforming an institution or practice. In the 16th century, we saw Luther come out. And he came against the Roman Catholic Church. And he, he said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're saved by grace. Not by indulgence. Not by indulgence. So they were selling indulgence to go to heaven. If your mama died, you went and sold your house and you went and gave it to the church so mama could go to heaven. Luther says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The word of God. The blood is. of the Roman Catholic Church. And he took out a little bit of truth. And we see the Lutheran today as that part of truth. Then the Baptist came out and said, hey, wait, you're supposed to be water baptized when you've accepted the Lord, not a baby. A little bit of truth. Pentecostals came out. Hey, we're supposed to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're, you have to speak in tongues or you're not saved. Precious 
one speaking in tongues is a gift. Amen. And the miracle also was they heard in their own language and got saved. We, we come up with all these denominations and non-denominations. Do you know Satan knows a house divided cannot stand? But we have stayed in the Roman Catholic root system. And God is saying enough is enough. He's saying it is time to come out of the Roman counterfeit church system and come one. There's one God, one Holy Spirit, one Messiah, and we're one body. We're not supposed to be divided. But we need, we need to be willing to have the new wine put in new wineskins and not hold on to tradition yes, right. and what man has given to us in denomination. I am sorry, but the truth is God's trying to heal some of us. Yes. He's trying to sanctify some of us. Yes. He's trying to get us transformed to look like the bride without yes. spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Yes. He is trying to move in our very midst. Yes. But we keep saying, oh no, oh no. I want, I want revival, but I want my Christmas tree in the sanctuary. Come on now. I want revival. I want revival, but oh, God, no, you, you know my heart, God. I'm doing it for you, God. Come on. I'm sorry. God's trying to heal us. He's trying to sanctify us. He's trying to pour out his Holy Spirit and give us truth. But we keep saying, no, God, I want my old wineskin. Thank you. I want the old tradition. I want to be in this old root system, of this counterfeit system. I don't want to change my life, but I want you to heal me. I want you to make me happy. I want a revival in my church. I want something new to happen. But oh, don't mess with my traditions. Don't mess with my hands. <laughs> I gotta eat my pork. I gotta eat my shellfish. Don't mess with my food. Come on, God. I want revival. But don't tell me I have to quit drinking. Don't tell me I have to quit doping. Don't tell me I have to quit sleeping around. Don't tell me I have to quit watching garbage on TV. I but let me stay the way I am. Now, let me ask you, are you the bride or are you not the bride? Are you going to let him prepare you for the second coming and get some stuff out of us? Are we going to keep asking for revival but don't mess with my tradition? Yes. Don't ask anything of me but make me happy. I want to be financially blessed, but I'm not going to give you 10% of my income. I want the windows of heaven open financially. I claim it, but don't ask me to give that ministry any money. I, because I need to go buy some new shoes and new clothes and new purses. Come on, you guys. We want his blessings, but we don't want to be obedient. Yes. The church is crying. It's broken. Yes. The bride is on life support. Yes. The bride is dying. Yes. And God is trying to move in these last days. Yes. But we don't want to you know, mess with anything that we're comfortable with that we've done all of our lives. Do you know tradition of man has made the word of God to no effect? Tradition of man. Now how can God heal us and restore us and sanctify us if we're not willing to get rid of junk that he's calling us to quit doing? Amen? Amen. In your generation, 
right now today. God is doing something so miraculous. Yes. But your will needs to come in and line up to his will. You need to say, yes, Lord. Yes. I want to be that bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Amen? Amen. There's a move that is about to hit us like we've never seen before. There is going to be a tidal wave of anointing coming. But guess what? It starts with each and every one of us first. If we don't line up, there's no way God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit like we've never seen. Why would he take people in the world and in false religions and bring them into a counterfeit belief system? When he started teaching me that Christmas is pagan, and Easter is pagan, and Halloween is definitely witchcraft or cult practice. I wanted to pretend like I never learned it. And he said, how are you going to go to the world and teach the world that's in different religions and teach them me if you're not willing to let go of tradition of man? If you're not willing to let go of the things of paganism and to come into the truth of his word, how are you going to go and bring somebody out of another religion and bring them into a town of it? God's not going to do that. We are in a reformation in our season, in our time, and tag your it. Amen. Tag your it. Amen. How many of you want to see that? Tidal wave Holy Spirit come. Because it's coming. But you need to be prepared and in position. Because one person is not going to be able to minister to all the babies coming in. And many of you have been in the body of Christ for a long time. And it's you that's got to step up to disciple the people coming in. But you need to be healed, delivered, sanctified, and transformed first. Amen? There's a move. There's a move getting ready to happen. There's going to be an outpour of his Holy Spirit. There's going to be an outpour like the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost came 50 days after Passover. It is from Leviticus 23. It was a, a Israel holiday. And Jewish people were in Jerusalem for P Pentecost, show the oat. And there's a move that's going to happen like you've never seen before. And I'm going to take you to Acts 2. 14 through 21 because the power of the Holy Spirit came when Pentecost was fully there. Pentecost had fully arrived. What does that mean? I always thought it was the Pentecostals of, of my age. No, the first Pentecostals were Jewish and they were there in Jerusalem for that third day that they had to be there because of Shobiot, because of Pentecost. And the power hit. Say the power hit. the power hit. See, God shows up on his days. God shows up in those Cairo moments. God shows up when the power of God comes in to our flesh time, our, our, this earth realm, and hits. And this was a Cairo moment. But it was right on target, right on calendar, right on the day that God said it would happen. Amen? Amen. It says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now what happened? The power of God hit. There was an earthquake. There was lightning. There was thundering. Just like what happened when they first got Torah at the mountain. When God was speaking and earthquakes was happening and fire and God was speaking from the 
that mountain, he gave them the Torah and they couldn't keep the loving instructions. So now we see that God said he would take out their stony heart, give them a new flesh, write his precepts upon their heart, the new covenant that we spoke about last week. And then he was going to give them the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. That they could keep his loving instructions because they failed from his loving instructions that he had originally given to them. So now this is what the prophet Joel, it's prophecies from the Old Testament. See, when God speaks something, it's going to come to pass. Amen. When God speaks it, it must come to pass. It's not like, oh, he changed his mind. Oh, you didn't pray enough, so, so it didn't happen. When God speaks, it will happen. Amen. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maids, men servants, and on my maid servants. Wow, maid servants. That means women too. Wow. That's amazing that God would think about having a woman do something in his kingdom. I, I can't believe that. I I'm told by men in the kingdom that only men can do anything. Come on, you guys. He's pouring out the spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. Whosoever. That means God has opened up his kingdom door. That if we receive the baptism, if we receive his son as Lord and Savior, our bridegroom, he's going to pour out his spirit on us. And he's going to save us as we read and we heard last week with the covenant. Go to Acts 3, 19, 26. Now, Peter preached his first sermon. Now, remember, Peter was scared to death when they arrested Jesus. Do you guys remember Peter? He denied Christ three times. He saw them abusing Jesus, Yeshua, and he's like, I don't know him. No, I don't. I said I don't know him. Now we see Peter in the face of the very people that arrested him and, and crucified him. And he's telling them, this was the man. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. We witnessed him raising from the dead on the third day, just like he said. And they're like, well, what do we have to do now? See, sometimes it's not too late. Sometimes it's not too late. Sometimes we think we've gone too far and we've done too much ugly stuff and we can't come back. Yeah. But I tell you, it's not too late. Amen. Not even for them, it wasn't too late. He says, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Yeshua HaMashiach, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. Reformation. Say, reformation is the same as restoration. He's restoring his word back to us. He's taking off all the garbage that the enemy has put on to the foundation of his word. He's restoring all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. You many, many Jewish people will not receive Yeshua because they said they're waiting for someone.
someone that's like Moses. Here we are, right here. This is like Moses, and Moses spoke it. Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant. Remember we spoke of covenant last week which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God raising up his servant Yeshua, sent him to bless you. In turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That was 2,000 years ago. How many of you know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. It is from generation to generation to generation to generation. Now we're 2,000 years away from that day at Pentecost. But let me take you to Matthew 24, 10 through 15, because we're in the last days. Yep. And I'm going to read to you what Yeshua said about the last days. And then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another. Does that sound like today? Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Precious ones, we need to know the word of God Amen. from the Hebrew perspective. Because this is no joke. If you don't know the word, you can be deceived because even the elect can be deceived. Yep. And it's the word that is our foundation and what we need to know and stand on. Amen? Amen? And because lawlessness, remember I tell you what the word law means? It's a transliteration of Torah. Torah is the first five books of your Bible. Torah is your foundation. You can't do away with the Old Testament and try to just build your Christian walk on the New Testament because it's like building a two-story house without the foundation in a first story. It's not going to stand. You need to know Torah, the first five books of your Bible. And because of Torahlessness will abound, the love, say love, you don't have love, you've got nothing. The love of many will grow cold, but he who endures till the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. What's the gospel? I've asked, I've prayed, Lord, what's the gospel? Most of my Christian walk, I'll tell you what the gospel is. It starts in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. See, God already knew our hearts were going to get broken, he already knew we were going to be offended. He already knew that we were going to be rejected. He already knew that because of Torlessness, what does that mean? For me, growing up in a dysfunctional home where my parents were alcoholics, that 
and my, my parents, my father was into pornography. Both of them was into adultery. They were, my mother was a legal drug addict. There was dysfunction in my home because of torlessness. Anybody raised in a dysfunctional home? Because parents didn't do, when, when I read and I study about our Hebrew roots and I see on Shabbat night, on Friday night, the family gets together and eats together and the father blesses the wife and he blesses the children. I'm sorry, on Friday night people got drunk and beat up in my home. Because of torlessness, the heart grows cold. Anybody grow up in dysfunction? Anybody grow up with molestation? Anybody grow up with physical and emotional abuse? We've come so far from what God created us to be. But guess what? He so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that this is the kingdom message. Luke 4, 14, 19. Then Yeshua returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Precious ones, he started his kingdom priestly anointing walk. He got water baptized, mikvah. How many of you ever wondered why Jesus had to be water baptized? If we get water baptized because we've accepted him and it's death, burial, and resurrection of him, why would he have to be? Because he's our high priest. And in Judaism, before they became a high priest, they would go through waters of purification. Our high priest, Yeshua, went through those waters of purification and the power of the anointing came on his life. And then he had spiritual warfare with Satan himself at the beginning of Luke 4. And he used Torah. He used the Word. He used the first five books of your Bible, mostly Deuteronomy, when he defeated Satan. How many of you think it's a little important to know the Word if that's called your sword? Because that's what you're going to fight with. When the enemy comes and lies to you, as he did with Yeshua, Yeshua said, it's also written. Do you know Satan knew the word better than most of us? Yes. He knows the word. And he twists the word, just a touch. Yeshua came back and said, but it's also written. It's written. It's written. It's written. That's what he used to defeat the enemy with. Then he returned in power. See, some of you are out in that wilderness place and you're fighting with the enemy. You're in warfare. You are in warfare. But I guarantee you that dry place, that dark place, that hard place, you are going to win. Amen. And you're going to return in power. Yes. Some of you don't believe that. Yeah. Let me tell you. I had to fight fear. I had to fight lust and seduction. I had to fight addictions. And I guarantee you, I had to fight rejection and abandonment. I had to fight all of those things. And what happened after I won, I returned in power. When you get through the battle that you're in right now, when you get through that wilderness place, when you get through that place where you're having to use the word and pull everything out from inside, when you think that God's not listening, when you think you're all by yourself, when you think that nobody's there for you, you're going through testing. You're going through trials. You're going through a place where you've got to dig for those answers that nobody can give you, but you have to do it because you have to know that you know that you know that you know that you know you know who you are and your, your call and your purpose and your authority in Messiah. Am I speaking to somebody today? Yeah. 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 On the way over here, I felt, Lord, I have no strength. Lord, I'm so tired. Lord, there's a spirit of slumber upon me. And you know what? I have to war. 
I had to war. I had to come against that spirit of slumber, that spirit of complacency. I had to say, oh, hell no, you're not going to keep me back. No, Lord, I want to go forward. You called me to the nations. How can I go to the nation if I'm so tired? All I want to do is sleep. I can't even think straight. If you guys ever been there, there's a war going on for your soul. There's a war going on for your mind. But when you get through that wilderness place, see, you can't look to man. Man, man can be there for you. Man can pray for you. Man can intercede for you. But your trust has to be in the Lord and in the Lord alone. Your love has to come from Him because people are broken. People are not going to give you the love that you need that you're looking for love in all the wrong places because they're broken. They're hurting. They're rejected. They're empty. And you're going to empty vessels to try to get what you need but they don't have what you need. The only place you can go is to the throne room of the living God and press in, press in. As Yeshua fought Satan, he was in battle. He was in wilderness, but he won with the word. The word is your weapon. The word is your weapon. The word is your weapon. Kick it up, kick it up. Uh, one day fear was on me so bad I was paralyzed. And God made me get up and fight. He told me, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. And I thought, what does love have to do with it? <laughs> what does a sound mind have to do? What do you mean power? What are you talking about? Well, now I know. Perfect love casts out all fear. The more love we have, the more faith we have. But the love that we need is only from Him because only He can give it to us, you guys. A sound mind. You have no sound mind when you're in fear. Do you know the power you walk in? Hold up your baby finger. Look at that baby finger. Look at it. You have more power in your baby finger than all of hell does. Yeah. You know why? Because you're in Christ. Hallelujah. And Christ is not defeated. Christ is not defeated. You walk in resurrection power. If you only knew the authority and power you walk in, you would shut those demons' voices down. Church. 
He's Jewish. He went to synagogue. He's our Jewish Messiah, our husband, our maker, is Jewish. Amen? So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. He had been brought up in Nazareth. That's in Israel. And as his custom was, say, as his custom was, as his custom. he went into synagogue on the Shabbat day, Sabbath day. Oh, he didn't change it to Sunday. Oh, well, how did it get changed to Sunday? Because of an antichrist spirit that was in Rome that hated the Jewish people that changed it to Sunday. Our Messiah, my, my bridegroom is Jewish. And he went to synagogue on a Shabbat, a Sabbath. And he did not change it to Sunday, the sun god worship. He went in as his custom was and is. Amen? And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable day, acceptable year of the Lord. It goes on to say he closed the book and he looked at him and said, today, Today, this was fulfilled in your presence. See, Isaiah was prophesying about our Lord, Messiah, Yeshua. That he was going to come and bind up the broken hearts. And Luke 4 talks about, he read this, he closed the book, he said this was fulfilled in, today in your presence. He went on in, in Luke 4. He went on and cast demons out of people in synagogue on Shabbat. He healed Peter's mother-in-law on a Shabbat after service. So what is this? There's healing. There's deliverance. There's sanctification. Luke 4, 42 through 44. Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, he said to them, I want you to hear this. I want every ear listening. I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. Because for this purpose, I have been sent. For this purpose, what was the purpose? He had spiritual warfare with Satan himself. He came to bind up the broken hearts to set the captives free. He cast demons out of people in a synagogue. He healed the sick. This is the kingdom message of restoration of the covenant that he had made with Abraham, that he has come with that blood covenant that to sanctify us, to cleanse us, to cover us, that we will have life and have it more abundantly. Amen and amen. 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 <clears throat> Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things, say all things, all things. say all things, all things, must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Do you know the Old Testament is about Yeshua? Mm -hmm. We read in Leviticus 23 all of these beautiful feast days that Satan absolutely hated is prophetic of our Messiah. He was born. This is the time he was born at the Feast of Tabernacles. He was born at this feast time. Scholars have 
and studied hard. And how they came up with the fact he was born at the Feast of Tabernacles was when John the Baptist was born. When did John the Baptist's mother get pregnant? John the Baptist would have been born at Passover, another feast day. Yeshua would have been born at the Feast of Tabernacles. He died at Passover. He rose on first fruits. We get the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Shoviot Pentecost. And that's from Leviticus 23. He's our high priest in the Day of Atonement. What did Moses write about him? What did the prophets write about him? Isaiah said he's going to come and bind up the broken hearts and set the captives free. Amen? Amen. It is our Father's will that your soul be restored. Amen. Mind, emotion, will. That you're not just saved and justified. The churches today are getting people saved, and they're telling them they're justified. Are you justified? You're saved by grace, absolutely. But there's got to be a transformation. And that transformation comes from restoration, sanctification, transformation, to bring glorification to our Father. The bride today, precious ones, is not bringing glorification to our Father. The church is dirty. The bride is filthy. But he is sending his spirit without measure. But we need to know the battle we are in. Amen. Because precious ones, you're in battle with an antichrist spirit. You're in battle with Satan. You're in battle with demons. And you better know your sword and sharpen it. And you better know the word. Amen? How many of us grow up feeling rejected and abandoned? That's the biggest trick in the book. Yep. He uses rejection and abandonment on about 99.9% .9 of the people. Why? Because we build walls around our heart. Love hurts. I'm not going to give my heart anymore. It hurts. It hurts too much. I don't want to get hurt again. Love does not hurt. Broken people break people. Love heals. And as we read in the last days, because of torlessness, the love of many is going to grow cold. See, precious, the enemy plays us. He plays us. How many ever felt lonely? I was so lonely growing up. A spirit of loneliness will drive you to do things you would not normally do. Rejection, abandonment. Satan deliberately wounds our hearts and causes us to become prisoners of war. He puts us in an emotional prison house so we won't be effective for the kingdom of God. If you're in jail, you're not going to do anything, right? You're behind these bars. How can you tell of the greatness of God when you're in a prisoner of war? There's a story I read one time. After, I think it was World War II, some of our soldiers went to the enemy's land to find prisoners of war missing in action. And they came across this, this prison for, for our military. And some of our guys were still in there being tortured. And the war was over. And they looked through the fence and go, what are you doing in here? And they go, we're prisoners of war. And, and the free guys go, hey, the war's been won. As soon as they learned that, they were free. But as long as they believe the captive, their captors, they were still prisoners. The war has been won. They're free. of unforgiveness, of 
of offense, of fear, of doubt, of intimidation. The war has been won. The bars that hold us in this prison are hurt, rejection and abandonment, unforgiveness, anger, rage, hatred, resentment, fear, doubt, unworthiness, guilt, sadness, victimization, loneliness, despair, discouragement, self-pity, depression, isolation, loss, inadequacy, shame, guilt, unworthiness, hopelessness, offense, despair, exhaustion, death, murder, suicide thoughts, just feeling like nothingness. How many of you thought Satan's like this big, ugly thing that you can see? These, a lot of things that I just named off are demons in our soul. And they have legal rights to be there because of our hurt and pain, because of what we've been through. But Yeshua said that he's come to set the captives free. He's come to set us free. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, literally our pain. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. The New Testament Greek tells us that the word for sorrows here literally refers to anguish, affliction, grief, pain, sorrow. How many of us have been through that? There's so much brokenness in us that God wants to heal. And we need that healing before we can be all that he's called us to be. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement for our peace, our shalom, was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our Father loves us so much, and he wants us healed. You know, inner healing, restoration, doesn't erase what you've been through. You need that, because that's going to be your testimony but it takes the pain away. It's like watching a movie with no emotions behind it. it. It's amazing for me to look back on my life and to see all that I've been through of rejection, of abandonment, of, of, of molestation, of, of physical abuse, verbal abuse, and have no emotion behind it any longer. Do you know how good that feels, you guys? That healing. But many of us have buried so much stuff because we had to survive. And we have hidden emotions that have never even come up, that we don't even remember sometimes what we've been through. And, and it's easy once we become a Christian to say, oh, it's all gone. It's, it's fine. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I'm a Christian now. God is so good. We wear a mask. We think we have to come in and, and have this certain speech about us. And we go away lonely and hurting. Precious ones, we need healing and deliverance in the body of Christ today. 
to prepare the bride for where he's taking us. Does that make sense? And we have to let him go deep and take that stuff out. Because broken people hurt broken. Broken people break people. Many of us have been broken. Has anybody out there been broken? And we're looking for these broken people to fix us. Broken people aren't going to fix you. I guarantee it. But this is what 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5 says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, say all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Anybody going through tribulation? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. And this one, this next verse, I thought, God, you've got to be kidding me. There is no way, God. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You know what? The first thing I would do was complain and murmur. I wouldn't count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete. That word perfect in Hebrew means mature. See, you go through hard to become mature. It's not the easy that matures you. It's the hard that matures you. It's the hard that stretches you. It's the trials that grow you. You don't learn anything on the mountaintop. You learn it in the valley. You learn it down there where you think God isn't even listening anymore. You learn it down there because then you have to call and get deep within yourself. What do you know? See, let me tell you, you're going to go through testing. And the testing is what produces fruit in your life. Because if you don't press into God, you're not going to make it. And it's not going to be easy. Those valleys are not easy. But that's where you're learning. That's where you're learning. That's where you're learning. That's where you're, you're going to learn. His love. His protection. He takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. And David says, and I'll fear no evil. See, when I started studying that Psalms, it came to me that David had been out running for his life from Saul. This was after he was a king, he wrote that. See, when you're out there running for your life in the desert place and the dry places, you don't know what God's going to take you and what you're going to get to the other side to do. But David was sitting there. I could just imagine him on his bed after, after him being a shepherd out there fighting a, a bear and a lion for his sheep. And then after Saul chasing him down, trying to kill him, him having to grow up a whole ragtag team of an army since they were all broke. They were all nothing people. See, God said, I'm sending you all the nothing people. <laughs> I'm raising up an army yeah. to fight yeah. from all the hurting, broken people. So David had to become a, a, a warrior out there in the wilderness place. He learned things like don't come against the anointing of God. Yeah. If God doesn't take him off his throne, you're to leave him alone because God will do it for you. 
See, he learned things out there that he couldn't learn any other way. You've been learning something you couldn't learn any other way. He's growing you. He's stretching you. And David said, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. See, when you've been in want, when you've been through poverty, when you couldn't go to the grocery store and buy things and you had to pray for everything you purchased, when you had to pray for gas money for your car, when you had to work every penny and you had to believe God was going to get you through, you're going to know that he's your provider and not the world's system. He's my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. See, sometimes you need to just stop and rest. Sometimes you get so busy and so tired and so fatigued that you don't even know that you need to rest. He says, come to me, all of you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is light. My yoke is light. David went on to say, even though I go through the shadow of the valley of death, I'll fear no evil. So the Lord took me in and helped me understand what that looked like for, for David being a shepherd. Because David would take his sheep down through this dark, dark valley where there was evil waiting. Death was waiting. Animals were waiting to attack the sheep here. But David was taking them down through this dark valley place so they could get eaten. You guys are shaking your head. You better watch what I say. <laughs> he was taking them through that place because he knew he was taking them to higher ground. He was taking them to a higher place. He was taking them to a better pasture. See, those dark places in your life isn't to destroy you. It's to take you to that higher place, that greater place, that place that he has for you. He would never take you through that dark valley of the shadow of death if he wasn't taking you higher. He's taking you higher. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to let him heal you completely and say, Lord, whatever it is, take it out. Go deeper in me. Clean house. See, there's stuff happening right now. It's a great time. This is Thanksgiving time. Oh, it's a wonderful time. We can be so grateful. And you show up with family and friends that you haven't seen in a long time. And you feel wounded. You have to deal with reality out there. Are you all by yourself? Nobody. Nobody invited you to dinner. Are you going to sit at the dinner table with an uncle that molested you? Are you going to have to go back and watch somebody in your family that's an alcoholic? cause a big draw to see. Oh, these, these holidays sound so wonderful until you really live them. And the reality sits in it, you're going to deal with people. I remember the ministry when I first started, I said, oh Lord, if I just didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> you're going to have to deal with people. And guess what? There's going to be pus pockets come up. You might have to be by yourself because nobody's inviting you. Spirit of rejection and abandonment. Spirit of lack. Not ever having someone love you. But your father loves you. And you have a love greater in him than what no man can give you that's broken. When you get around familiar people from your past, you're going to be pushed in on. I can almost guarantee you. Can I, can I make a suggestion? Don't let someone else determine who you are. Amen. Stay on your ground. Yes. Stay in your position. Yes. And when 
you're pushed in on what comes up is what's still there. All of a sudden, you're angry, you're mad, you're cussing. We're going to talk about those things next week. <laughs> After the holidays. <laughs> because what's inside is going to be pushed in on. And if there's still pus pockets there, emotions are going to erupt in you. Anybody out there? So when you feel like a volcanic emotion going off inside, there's something else in there that needs to be healed. There's pus pockets. I could hit, if I have a pus pocket on my arm, it's all infected. I could, you can hit up here all day long. And it's okay. You barely touch it. Have you guys ever had something so infected you touch it and it's like, that hurts? Or your sore toe and you keep stubbing it? It hurts. We have hurts down here that some of us don't even remember. And God is wanting to bring them up and out and heal them. That's what he does. But how many of you know it's uncomfortable? Anybody? So I'm going to give you some homework for this week. When you get around somebody that's pushing your buttons, how many of you have people push your buttons? When you get around somebody that's pushing your buttons, go, oh Lord, where does this come from? Have you ever said this always happens? This is always like this for me. It always happens like this. It follows me. I used to think I had a thing on my forehead molest me. Sometimes you go through the same thing over and over and over. Anybody? It's like a mountain you're going around 100,000 times. Stop, get by yourself with the Lord and say, where is it coming from, Lord? Be still. Let him show you if there's still a pus pocket there. And say, Lord, heal this area too. Can you guys do that this week? You're to show the love of Christ this week. Don't let other people's demons yank you around. Don't let other people's temperaments yank you around. Don't let other people's agendas yank you around. You are to stay your position of who you are in Messiah. Amen? Amen. I went back to Texas as a young girl. Boy, I immediately emotionally went back to my family of origin to be the youngest. And my sisters were bossing me around and I was listening. And the Lord said to me, get back in your position. You're no longer little Patty, the youngest of all of them. You're Dr. Patricia with the high anointing on your life. Get in position. Because they need to see the anointing in you. They don't need to see your trust pockets. They need to feel the love that God has for you that wants to flow through you. Amen? Amen. I'm going to close with this Thanksgiving Psalms, and I'm going to open up the altar. Psalms 107, 1 through 22. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Say that with me. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Have you been redeemed? You're no longer a prisoner of war. He's redeemed you from the hand of the enemy and gathered you out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. 
They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. How many of you cried out to the Lord in your trouble? And he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, your mind, your emotion, your will, and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness for, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broke the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools, because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul are harbored all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. They cried out to the Lord in their distresses, and he saved them. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. I'm going to close in prayer, then I'm going to open the altar. But when you come up here, I want you just to worship for a few minutes. I want you to, to focus on his goodness. I want you to say, Lord, heal me and I'll be healed. Save me and I'll be saved. I want you to say, Lord, whatever's in me, search me out, Lord, and take it out. I want to be healed in all those hidden places that I don't even know are still broken, that I might glorify your name while I'm still alive in Yeshua's name. Father, we thank you. Oh, that your mercy is so good, Father. And oh, that if men would only give thanks to you for your goodness, for your wonderful works, Lord, to the children of men. Father, we thank you that you sent your only begotten Son to die at Calvary. That you bore our griefs and our sorrows, Yeshua, and by your stripes were healed. And Father, we thank you for your wonderful works. We thank you for your covenant with us. We thank you for what you've done for us and how you want us to be restored in our soul. That we would glorify your holy name in these last days. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen and amen. I think I'll have Pastor Brad bless you if you want to leave. You won't stay, have to stay behind. But if you want prayer, please stay and get prayer before you leave. So I'm going to have Pastor Brad come up and bless you.
You have a Rechem Yahweh by Yishim Erechem. You have Er Yahweh, Hanabha Lecha, Bidu Benet. Isa Yahweh, Hanabha Lecha, Be'asem Lecha. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance 